This video will be a complete step-by-step -step procedure for overhauling a Chrysler 9.25 differential with a track lock limited slip. We will remove, completely rebuild, and install the differential with new ring, pinion, and clutches, and measure pinion depth and preload. This is a 2004 Dodge Ram 1500. A steadily increasing wind developed in my diff, so I decided to tear into it to investigate. As there weren't a lot of videos documenting the entire process, I decided to make one. Be warned, this is a job not for the faint of heart. There are some specialty tools that I do not have, but I will show you how to get it done regardless. Watch the full video before tackling this yourself, and if you don't feel confident with it, take it to a professional and fork over the cash. First thing to do is get the truck secured on jack stands. Remove the four bolts securing the drive shaft and remove the shaft from the pinion flange. Remove all differential cover bolts and be ready to catch all the gear oil with a good sized drip pan. Inspect the magnet at the bottom of the case for debris. I found one of the clips holding the clutch packs together so I knew there was an issue. I also found that a clip had come loose in the differential and was rubbing onto one of the bearing caps. Must have been rubbing for quite some time as you can see a significant ridge that was created in the metal. You'll see it better when the bearing caps are removed. Make sure to mark the position so they're installed in the same orientation. I'll take the adjuster securing clip off, then remove this cap. This one is pretty obvious as to which side it will go back in. See that groove? It's not supposed to be there. Before removing the other side, let's get the wheel ends disassembled. Tire, caliper, caliper bracket, thin rotor. Same on both sides. Remove the retention pin securing bolt, then remove the pin. Push each axle towards the differential and remove the securing axle clip. Then remove the axles and set them safely aside. I'll remove the other bearing adjuster clip and bearing cap now. At this point the differential could fall out so be careful. I had to back off the adjusters in order to remove it. You can do this without a special tool from inside with a pick. Just go slow and back off the adjuster until you can get the diff out. You will need a special tool to reinstall the differential and adjust it properly. I'll show you that tool during the reassembly phase. Grab the diff and wiggle it out of there. Be careful, it's heavy. If you're reusing your gears, make sure you set it on something soft. I'll back off the other adjuster at this point. You really want to remove them completely and do a thorough cleaning. Then reinstall them all the way backed off. Onto the pinion flange. Remove the bolt, then smack the pinion with a dead blow to drive it through and get the flange off. Here is the remove the differential assembly and pinion gear. Now is where you really want to inspect all your bearing races for damage. That whine I was hearing definitely came from this bearing race. Look how pitted it is. That's pretty awful. Okay, whack the seal out of there by any means necessary, and we'll work on the pinion bearing races. If you look at the back side of the race, you'll see a recess on the top and the bottom. Use a punch here to drive the races out. Same for the other side. Now that the races are out, you can see a small pit starting on one of the differential bearing races and major damage here on that pinion race. Every bearing will be replaced and I suggest the same for you if you're going to be in the case like this. Now on to the differential bearings. We need to get those off of the differential. I tried using a bearing separator, but it didn't work at all. So I split the roller and cage and removed all rollers, then used a chisel to help separate it from the differential. Just don't go too far down and hit the machined edge where the bearing is pressed on. Using heat here helps immensely. Once it was driven out just a bit, I was able to get a ball joint separator on it with a socket as a spacer. This worked surprisingly well, and I would suggest this process to anyone. That bearing is off, and now I'll work on the other side. Same process. Rollers, heat, puller. At this point, you're going to need some nuts, bolts, and washers in order to compress the clutch discs. These are the ones I got for the job. They worked, but it did involve some cutting to get everything just right. Install the bolts with the washers on the ends, then tighten them down to compress the clutches. Make sure you do both sides. With the clutches and gears compressed, the spider gears are loose enough to get the shims out of the back. Be sure to mark these gears as they should go back in their original spots. Next we've got to get the spider gears out, and to do that you have to either spin the drive gears or use a punch. I shoved an axle through one side and spun it against the differential housing to spin them out. It was difficult, but it eventually worked.
Remove the bolts, all gears, clutch discs, and clips, and make sure that the case is clean and free of any damage. This is a clutch disc clip, and you should have four of these in the differential. Inspect the clutch discs for wear. Mine were still in good shape, but will be replaced anyway. Inspect the gears for wear as well. At this point, I'll be removing the ring gear for replacement. While I'm in here, I might as well put 456s in it, right? If you're not removing the ring gear, you can disregard this step. These bolts are left-hand threads, so spin them to the right to loosen. Here's the old gear, and here's the new. While doing this work, it's a good idea to soak your clutches in clean gear oil. This will help them break in easier on the initial drive. They are twist tied together, and leave them tied until time for install. Remove the tie and place them in the exact order on the gear, starting with the convex spring. The concave, or bowl, will face the clutch discs. One by one, install them in order onto the gear, then secure them with the new clips. Using oil or grease will help all this stick in place. Then feed the assembly into the differential and make sure the clips align with the holes on either side. Secure it with the bolt and washers from before. Make sure the clips are visible. Same thing for the other gear. Again, concave side towards the discs, bowl side up. Secure with new clips, then feed into the differential and bolt it down. Make sure everything looks good before proceeding further. The spider gear reassembly is probably the worst part of this whole job. You've got to align the gears on both sides and somehow drive or spin them in together. Using a brass punch was the only way I could get them in, as spinning by hand with new clutches was quite difficult. Just go slow and make sure they're moving at the same time. They need to be orientated exactly 180 degrees from each other when finished. You may need to play with the tension on the bolts to help them spin. Again, just go slow and make sure everything spins in unison. Once the spider gears are in place, tighten the bolts extremely tight to compress the clutches and then install the shims on the back side of the spider gears. Drive the pin in to hold them in place. This is the pin recommended for 456 gears with a notch in the center. It didn't work as planned, but I'll explain that a little later. For now, just drive whatever pin you have in place to hold everything together. Okay, I have new bolts for the ring gear, so I'll install that with some Loctite and torque it into place. Make sure you have a torque wrench that can do left-hand thread. Some, like this click type, cannot. Differential complete, let's work on the pinion gear. Once again, the separator didn't work, but I had these large two-jaw pullers that worked perfectly. After some heat, of course. Once the bearing is removed, you'll need to measure your shim pack. This helps set the pinion depth. If you're reusing your ring and pinion, just use the same shims and you should be good. As I was replacing everything with different sized parts, I needed to measure just to get a baseline. What really helps with pinion depth is if you can get two sets of pinion bearings. They need to be the same brand and model. Instead of going ahead and driving the new bearings on and hoping everything fits perfectly the first time, you'll want to hone the inside of one set of bearings so that they'll slip on and off easily. This way you can play with the pinion depth before final assembly. It takes some work, but boy is it worth it. Shave out some material little by little until it just slips over the pinion. Make sure they're the same size as what you'll be running so the races will fit the same. Don't use a different brand bearing here. Speaking of races, let's go ahead and drive those in. I'm using the old race to help drive it down so I'm not hitting on the new one. Okay, let's measure the shims and install the new ones onto the pinion. I can't tell you what to run here. You'll need to do this step for yourself. There's no one size fits all. Slip the test bearing over with the crush sleeve. I'll use the old one here. Install the pinion, then put the other test bearing on. Secure the pinion with the flange and make sure there's no play. It should spin, but not have any other movement. At this stage, you'll need to find what your pinion depth should be. What they're talking about is the center line of the ring gear to the top of the pinion head. In order to do this without spending two or three hundred dollars for the tool, I'm going to install the bearing caps, then measure the inner diameter. Then measure each cap opening to the seam. You're trying to find if the seam is dead center in the bearings, which it's usually not. Measure the full diameter, then subtract the cap to see where the flat edge lies in relation to the center line. Then you can use this flat edge to measure the top of the pinion head. Hopefully this all makes sense. If the diameter is 3 inches and the cap depth is 1.5 inches, 
then the flat edge of the housing is right in the middle. If the cap depth is one inch, then you'll need to subtract a half of an inch to whatever you measure. Doing this is tricky, but if you take your time with it, you'll be in a better position for reassembly without having to take everything apart. You still need to do a pattern test for your final confirmation though. Add or remove shims to get your measurement, then once you're satisfied, install the shims and drive the new bearing down. Install the pinion and place the new bearing on the flange side. Use the flange to drive that bearing down. Don't forget your seal, you'll have to knock off the flange in order to do that. Next we'll set pinion preload. Make sure you're lubing all the bearings with clean oil as you go here. Drive the pinion nut down until you get a turning torque of about 16 to 19 inch pounds, somewhere around there. Let's check depth one last time before the diff goes in. Going to follow for differential install. Put the diff into place with new bearings and races, then install the caps. Snug, but not torqued yet. Use the special bearing adjuster tool to tighten the driver's side bearing adjuster into the housing, pushing the differential into the pinion. Next, drive the passenger side adjuster in. You should have no play at all at this point, so you'll loosen the driver's side and tighten the passenger side until you get about three to four thousandths of an inch play. Then tighten the adjusters to 10 foot-pounds. Recheck your play, then torque the caps to 100 foot-pounds. Next, torque the passenger side adjuster to 75 foot-pounds. Recheck your play, and you want about five to eight thousandths. If it's too tight, then keep tightening the passenger side adjuster until it comes into spec. If it's too loose, start the whole thing over again. I ended up having to tighten mine to about 100 foot-pounds before I got my five thousandths of play. Once the proper play is achieved, tighten the driver's side bearing adjuster to 75 foot-pounds as well. Then secure the adjusters with the clips. So differential in place, caps snug. Using the special adjuster tool for this rear end, take the play out of the differential on the driver's side first, then the passenger. Check play with the dial indicator. It'll be tight, so back off the driver's side and increase the passenger side. If it's too much, just adjust it up. Follow the process as outlined and you'll be fine. Once this is done, we're going to take a gear pattern measurement. Paint some teeth with marking compound, then spin the diff by the pinion, then by the ring gear, forwards and backwards. It's a good idea to put some drag on the ring gear with a pry bar while you do this. You're looking for a pattern that's just about centered on the tooth for the drive and coast side. If it's too close to the bottom, remove a shim. Too high to the top, add one. A lot of people have their own preference with this, so use your best judgment and go slow. Don't quit until it's perfect, or else you'll be doing this all again very soon. Next we'll put the axles in, and this is where I'll talk about that notched pin. The theory is that with the notch, you spin it to one side, install the axle clip, then turn it over to the other side and install that axle clip. Neither side worked for me, and I tried for way too long to try and get it to work. I finally decided to give up and go back with the original straight cut pin, but now there was another dilemma. The pin wouldn't come out with the new, bigger ring gear. So I shaved two teeth just enough so the pin would slide out. You gotta do what you gotta do. With bigger ring gears, sometimes it's a necessity. Just don't go crazy. Okay, so axle clips can go on now. Here's the two pins side by side. Then I'll drive the straight pin in place. It worked perfectly. Secure it with the hold down bolt, and I used some Loctite for peace of mind here. Now it's time for a new gasket and to install the cover. Torque the bolts down in a crisscross pattern, then fill the case with clean oil until it starts running out of the fill plug. Clean the cover, then time for the drive shaft. Once that's secured, we'll get the rotors, bracket, caliper, and wheel fitted to both sides. Then put her on the ground and you're ready to roll. Break in with the new ring and pinion is 500 miles, so go slow. No burnouts here. For the first 50 miles or so, drive it like 15 to 20 minutes, then let it sit and cool off. Doing this will greatly increase the lifespan of a new ring and pinion. So that's the process of doing this type of a job. You saw I didn't have every single tool you might expect to do this, but you can get it done using typical tools. If you're not confident in your ability to do a job like this, get help from a friend or take it to a shop and have it done so you don't have to worry about it. Halfway through this process, that's what I wish I had done myself. I hope you found this video informative. If you enjoyed it, make sure you give it a like and hit that subscribe button. Also, if you have comments, leave them down below. I'd love to hear from you all and see what you think or if you have any suggestions for anyone doing this job. 
If you've done this yourself, how was it? Did you run into issues? I'll see you all in the next video. As always, thanks for watching.